Good morning. As you guys can see, we get to share in a baptism this morning, which is about one of the most exciting things that I think can happen in a Sunday morning service. So I'm really, really excited that you guys all get to be here with us. And for those of you who are online, I'm excited that you get to watch with us and celebrate as somebody makes such an important commitment to following Jesus. We are just, oh man, it's going to be a good Sunday, y'all. So I got just a couple of announcements for you uh, before we get started in our service. Uh, tonight, we are doing Christmas caroling, like a drive-by kind of thing. So if you are interested in being a part of our Christmas caroling drive-by, uh, get to the church, meet up in the parking lot, right, maybe around 2.45 this afternoon, we will be leaving at 3 o'clock, so you're going to want to be here so that we can get all set up and figure out the order and everything, and then we'll be leaving at 3 o'clock. And then we have our Christmas Eve services. Christmas Eve services, those are all going to be in the sanctuary at 3, se yeah, three 7, and 10. I'm going to confuse myself for a minute. <laughs> so 3 o'clock, 7 o'clock, and 10 o'clock, all in the sanctuary on Christmas Eve. We hope to see you guys there. Uh, once again, thank you guys so much for being here with us this morning. If you guys would please bow your heads with me as we prepare to go into worship. Father God, I thank you so much for this opportunity to come together and to worship you. And God, to be able to celebrate a baptism. God, somebody coming into new life through committing their life to you. God, I just pray that we would open up our hearts, our minds, and our spirits to what it is that you intend to do in this place and where it is you intend to lead us out after. We love you so much, Jesus, and it's in your name we pray. Amen. Stay by my cradle 
church. Y'all doing okay this morning? If you're watching with us online, and I've noticed that uh, Utah, Dallas, uh, let's see, where else? Florida have checked in this morning. Also Gardendale, thank you all for checking in online with us. And thank you for being here this morning. Uh, it's, exciting. it's an exciting day because we're celebrating the sacrament of baptism. Amen. So it's an exciting moment this morning on this fourth Sunday in Advent. GMVUMC.org is our website. If you're visiting, we'd love for you to go in there and fill out a connection card so we can get to know you better. Okay. Uh, I want to introduce two candidates for baptism this morning. I want to introduce Cheyenne and I want to introduce Josh. And they're going to come this morning. And for all my medical people who are worried that they're going into the same water for baptism, they're part of the same household. Okay. Just want to make that clear for my medical folks. Okay. I want to ask you the historical questions that the church has always asked those who come to be baptized. On behalf of the whole church, do you renounce the spiritual forces of wickedness? Do you reject all the evil powers in this world? And do you repent of your sin? If so, would you say, I do? Amen. Do you accept the freedom and the power that God gives you to resist evil, injustice, and oppression in whatever forms they present themselves? Amen. Do you confess Jesus Christ as your Savior? Do you put your whole trust in His grace? And do you promise to serve Him as your Lord in union with the church which Christ has opened to people of all ages, nations, and races? If so, would you say, I do? Amen. Church, this question is for you. Will you nurture Josh and Cheyenne in Christ's holy church? Will you set an example? Will you teach? Will you pray? And will you accept God's grace along with them? Will you profess your faith openly along with them? And will you all work harder to be led into living a more Christian life? If so, would you say amen? Amen. amen. According to the grace given you, will you accept Cheyenne and will you accept Josh as your brother and your sister in the faith and do all you can throughout their lives to encourage them? If you would do this, would you say, we will? We will. Amen. All right. We ready? Feels warm. Got it? All right. Be careful right there. There you go. All right. Is it cold in the bottom? I'm sorry. <laughs> I get you to sit on that ledge right there. There you go. <laughs> okay. I'm going to ask Cheyenne's family, if they would, to stand, if they would, just to support her. Okay. I'm going to get you to hold your nose with that other hand, okay? <clears throat> Cheyenne, I baptize you. In the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Spirit. Amen. Father, pour out your Holy Spirit upon Cheyenne. Help her, God, always to lead a life that leads to love and grace following you throughout her days. Help her grow into the woman that you want her to be. In Jesus' name, amen. Amen. All right. Need a hand up or you got it? Okay. Well, teeth are chattering, so it's colder than I thought. <laughs> oh. All right. I'm going to take this hand, Josh. All right. Josh, I baptize you in the name of the Father and of the Son, and of the Holy Spirit. Amen. Father, pour out your Holy Spirit upon Josh. God, help him to lead a Christian life in all he does, and help him, God, to lead his family in a way that leads to eternal life. God, we praise you and give you honor and glory this day. In the name of Jesus, amen. God bless you, brother. Amen. When they get dried off and come back, we'll celebrate some more. 
This is the fourth Sunday of Advent, the fourth Sunday of expectation, and this is the Sunday, and I think this is very appropriate. This is the Sunday that we light the candle of love on the Advent wreath. Mr. and Mrs. Mark Ford are going to come and help us out with that today. So we're going to invite them to come. And I want to thank all the young people for being here and witnessing this. Thank y'all. Okay. We live on the brink every day. We stand on the threshold between this world and the next one. We live and move between the ordinary and the divine, between the mundane and the mystery. Too often we forget to look up and see the angels in our living room. We forget that the love we give and live is a sign of eternity. God with us right now. We forget that company is coming. Luke tells us that God's favor came to a girl, an ordinary girl. It might have been you or your daughter. It might have been the girl down the street or your grandchild. But the messenger of God came and greeted her and said, The Lord is with you. What a gift. What a promise. Emmanuel, God is with us. We light these candles with peace in our hearts for the promise of proximity, the nearness of God. Even when we forget to listen, to lean into that presence, God is as close as our own breath. This, in a confused and confusing world, is a peace that, promise, that passes all understanding. It is the peace that comes, that company is coming. O come, O come, Emmanuel.
You may be seated. What a great way to begin a service, and thank you for the music this morning, amen. And a lot of people think that the Sunday after Christmas is a Sunday you can take off. It, it's not. So next Sunday, we've got membership vows being taken. Okay? We've got some members joining next Sunday, so it's a reason to come back. Amen. Amen. Yeah. Take that, pandemic. Amen. <laughs> Take that. Praise the Lord. Praise Jesus. <laughs> There's an offering basket back here. If you'd like to give online, there's a way to do that online under the Connect tab on the website, gmvumc.org. Thank you for your faithfulness and your giving. Uh, we're going to pray just for a moment for the offering. Then we'll worship some more, okay? Let's pray. God, we do thank you so much for your marvelous grace. We do thank you, Lord, that you... Ask us to be generous. And God, I thank you for the, the opportunity, Lord, to be generous. It truly is more blessed to give than it is to receive. And God, I pray that as we give, that you pour out your Holy Spirit upon the giver. God, give them a, a blessing that they cannot receive. And Lord, let, let us receive these tithes and offerings for the upbuilding of your kingdom, for the winning of souls. For it's in the name of the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit that we pray. Amen. Thank you. Thank you, Billy. Take a few moments and uh, be safe, but greet one another. And if you want to celebrate with Cheyenne and Josh just for a moment, do that just for a few minutes. Good morning. How are y'all? Good. Sometimes I'm reminded that Advent may not necessarily be in your faith tradition. Advent is simply the four Sundays leading up to Christmas. It comes from a Latin word that means coming. We celebrate the many ways that Jesus comes to us. He came to us as a babe in Bethlehem's manger. He comes to us continually through the Word and through the Holy Spirit. And He will come again in all of His glory. Amen. And so that's what we celebrate before the, before, and Advent ends on Christmas Eve. And then we hit our 12 days of Christmas. Did you kids know that there's 12 days in Christmas, not just one? So tell mom and dad to go buy some more presents. <laughs> I'm just kidding. Uh, kidding, not kidding, right? Um, <clears throat> so in this, in this season, I'm, I'm very aware that that Jesus was born into a world that was very broken, into a world where, where Rome ruled with an iron fist, where the Pax Romana, the Roman peace, was only held at the end of a Roman sword. If you got out of line, you know what would happen to you. And that was the world that Jesus stepped into, born in a lowly manger in a backwater part of the Roman Empire. 
uh, he, he, his announcement was not given to kings. The announcement of his birth was not given to the kings. It was not given to Caesar. It was given to shepherds. It was given to shepherds and those who are lowly. And these mysterious magi from the east that saw a star in the skies, these stargazers, these astrologers knew even though they were not of Jewish heritage, even though they had no idea of the story of Yahweh, they recognized the birth of a king. <laughs> and they traveled all the way from the east to follow a star that stood above where the young child was. What, a, what an incredible story. Uh, I'm, I'm very aware of the threat of COVID-19, as, as we all are, I'm, a woman that I'm well acquainted with not only has lost her husband, but two of her sisters this year. You know. And I, I, I'm reminded of how devastating it is to live in a broken world. Because we still live in a broken world, and we're kind of the ones that broke it. Amen? Because God created us and placed us in paradise. And since that time, God has been calling us back to himself. First, he called us back through the law, through Moses. Then he called us back through the Old Testament prophets. And last of all and best of all, he sent his son, Jesus Christ, to call us back to himself through Jesus. Everything that God can do to come to us in our brokenness, God is doing to bring us back to him. It is, it is hard being made in the image of God because being made in the image of God just like God, I make my own decisions, and so do you. So there's this interplay of the work of the Spirit and the stubborn will of humans. Anybody here stubborn? This is a place to confess that. Amen. We live, we live way on the other side of Christmas. And the ancient Jews, they spent a lot of time and a lot of money and a lot of energy to celebrate the ways that God had blessed them. That's what Passover was all about. Passover was a, all of the high Jewish holidays, it was, they were invested themselves into it to celebrate what God had done for them, to celebrate being led out of 400 years of slavery in Egypt to, to celebrate that even though it seems like right now God is silent, we know that God has not abandoned his people because that's the one thing that God cannot do is abandon his people. Uh, I, I remember, and I don't know why this comes to mind this morning, a, a Middle Eastern girl that visited <clears throat> because we had neighbors that were Middle Eastern and of, of Muslim heritage. And, and I remember her visiting at Christmas. And she'd never visited the United States before. And first of all, when she drove through from the Atlanta airport and they drove her through the wooded areas of uh, Georgia and Alabama, she said, dear God, you live in a paradise. You live in a garden. Everywhere I look, there's a garden because, you know, where she came from, there was just a lot of sand. Amen? She'd never seen any place like this. And seeing everything at Christmas, she said, my goodness, you make such a big celebration out of the birth of a baby. She couldn't believe it. And when, when she visited church, Amazingly enough, she said, what is a Bible? I just happened to have a connection with Wycliffe Bible translators at the time, and I was able to get her a Bible in her native language, which if caught with it in her country would probably cause her to be executed. But she got a Bible. Amen? And she probably had to keep it hid. But when she went back to the Middle East, she knew what a Bible was. Amen. Those of us in America take it for granted, don't we? That we have Bibles sitting in the back seat of the car or on the coffee table gathering dust. And a lot of times we lose the excitement of what God has done through Jesus, don't we? Because it's so mundane and it's so workaday and we've all heard the story and we don't like to be bored. 
Have you ever watched the before and after shows on TV? This, uh, you know, they do makeover shows. Y'all watch HDTV, I know y'all do, because my wife watches that all the time. They'll make over a person, right? Here's a frumpy person and here's a movie star afterwards, right? Or, or they'll make over a business. The business is going into the ground and they make it over now. It's being successful. Or they'll, make, or they'll redo a house, right? Which is my wife's favorite shows, right? So this, you've got this dump afterwards and this, this mansion, a dump before and a mansion afterwards, right? And this is what I find myself doing a lot if Donna has the show recorded. You watch the first three minutes and you watch the last three. <laughs> I mean, just fast forward through all that mess, right? This is what it looked like before. This is what it looked like after. But you don't see the struggle it takes to get from before to after. We're working hand in hand with God. The Holy Spirit doesn't force us to do anything. The Holy Spirit leads us. Baptism is the beginning. It is a profession of faith. Yes, Lord, this is what I intend to do. And we want to reach perfection, but there's a whole lot of distance between the first three minutes and the last three. Amen? And it's through that period of life on this earth that God wants to hold our hands and that God wants to lead us through. The people were slaves in Egypt for 400 years. And when Jesus came, they were slaves to the Roman Empire. From Malachi, the last book of the Old Testament, to Matthew, the first book of the New Testament, 400 years. The people in Egypt were in slavery 400 years. Preachers like to call that 400 years between the Old Testament and the New Testament the 400 years of prophetic silence. Right? When God didn't speak. Now, there were preachers and prophets running around all over the place. But none of them are recognized as the Christian church as being authoritative and from God. Amen? 400 years. 400 years they had been hearing Deuteronomy 18 in the synagogue and in the temple. Deuteronomy 18, verse 18 through 19. This is God speaking to Moses. He's talking about the last days to Moses. I will raise up for them a prophet like you, Moses, from among their fellow Israelites, and I will put my words in his mouth. He put his words in Moses' ears, but the prophet that's going to come, he's going to put his words in his mouth. He will tell them everything I command him. I myself will call to account anyone who does not listen to my words that the prophet speaks in my name. If you read from Exodus and Deuteronomy, you read about the prophet that is promised. And they were waiting for a prophet like Moses. For 400 years they'd been waiting for the prophet like Moses. They had been waiting for Deuteronomy 18 verses 18 through 19 to be fulfilled. Moses and Jesus were a whole lot alike, just like the scriptures say. What if I told you, what if I came in and I told you this? I want to talk to you today about a man that when he was born, there was a king trying to kill all the babies. That applies to Moses. That applies to Jesus. What if I said the bed that he lay in at his birth was made of grass? Moses lay in a basket and was set among the bulrushes in the Nile River. Jesus lay in the straw of a manger. And what if I said this prophet came to establish a covenant between God and man. Moses came to establish a covenant. Jesus came to establish a covenant. And what if I said he has came to deliver the people from 400 years of slavery. It applies to both of them. When John came, in John chapter 1, when John the Baptist was out there eating, eating locusts and wild honey and, and shouting like a madman, repent, repent for the kingdom of God is at hand, they asked him, are you Elijah? And he said, I am not. 
are you the prophet? They were refer referring to Deuteronomy. Are, are you the prophet that's been promised us? No, no, no. I am not even worthy to carry his sandals. It's not me. It's not me. When Philip, if you read a little further in John chapter 1, when Philip meets Jesus and he goes to see Nathanael, he says this, he says, Nathanael, come and see. This is the one that Moses told us about. He had heard those words in church all of his life. In Luke chapter 4, verses 18 through 19, this is Jesus standing up in the synagogue at 30 years of age. And he's reading from Isaiah 61. Isaiah 61 was written 700 years before Jesus was born. And this is what Jesus does. He says, the spirit of the Lord is on me. He's reading from Isaiah now. He, they hand him the scroll of Isaiah. And I know he's grinning. And I know he's grinning. And he's looking up the Father and he's saying, I see what you're doing. The Spirit of the Lord is on me because he has anointed me to proclaim good news to the poor. He has sent me to proclaim freedom for the prisoners and recovery of sight for the blind, to set the oppressed free, to proclaim the year of the Lord's favor. And then he did something very odd that you're not supposed to do in synagogue. He rolled up the scroll and he gave it back to the attendant and he sat down. You're supposed to expound upon the scripture. You're supposed to preach after you read the scripture. You're not just supposed to roll it up and hand it back to the attendant. And, and, and he went and sat down and it says that the eyes of everyone in the synagogue were fastened on him. And they're thinking, well, that's a short sermon. I'm going to beat the Baptist to the cafe. Church is over. I guess that's it. There's not going to be an expounding on the scripture. They're waiting on him to say something else. They're waiting on him to tell them about the promise of the one that, that Moses promised them. That they're, they're waiting on all of that, and this is what he says. Today, this scripture is fulfilled in your hearing. You don't have to wait any longer. <laughs> Today, and they're like, isn't he Joe's boy? Isn't his daddy a carpenter? Moses came to lead the people to freedom from slavery in Egypt. Jesus came to lead us to freedom from our slavery to sin and death. Y'all tweet that, please. Okay? That's tweetable. Put it on Instagram. Light up Facebook. Moses came to lead us to freedom from slavery in Egypt. Jesus came to lead us from freedom of sin and death. Moses stood before Pharaoh and he said, let my people go. Jesus stands before sin and death and says, let my people go. That deserves an amen. Amen. Y'all don't, don't get slack on me now. But we don't think of ourselves as slaves to sin. As a matter of fact, we proud Americans don't like to think of ourselves as slaves to anything. That's why we post all that garbage in social media. I ain't going to do this and I ain't going to do that. Nobody's going to tell me what to do. Y'all with me? We don't say, I'm a slave to sin and death. We say, Pastor, I'm struggling with something. I'm, I'm dealing with some stuff. We don't like to confess, even though confession is a part of the salvation experience, we don't like to confess that we're slaves to sin and death. Romans 8, 1 through 2, Paul tells the church at Rome, there is no condemnation for those who are in Christ Jesus because through Christ Jesus, the law of the Spirit who gives us life has set you free from the law of sin and death. Remember that song that we sing? I'm no longer a slave to sin. I am a child of God. It comes from right here. It comes from right here. Good contemporary music and good hymns come straight from the Bible. Y'all with me? Let me just go through 
on this last Sunday of Advent, how you know that you might be a slave to sin. I think we need a reminder. Number one, you keep doing what you're doing despite the negative consequences. You just keep doing what you're doing. Order another round. I know a guy who went on an online car auction because he saw a Mercedes on there he wanted. And when it started, it was the right price. So when the auction started, and it's a timed auction now, you only got so many times to get your bid in, right? So he's bidding on this Mercedes that he's looked at online, and he puts in a bid. But then what happens? Other people start bidding. Oh, no, no, I got to up it. So you up it. So you up it. I know somebody else bids. No, I got to up it. Yeah, I got to up it. <laughs> it's not that much more than it was in the last bid. Up, 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 up. He won the bid, but he got it for more money than he had. He, got, he was out of control. He was out of control. He had to go max out his credit cards and he had to borrow money from his family because he couldn't pay for this Mercedes that now he legally was responsible for. And when he went to get the Mercedes, the engine was completely ruined. It, and, and this is what sin promised. Sin so shows you something that's beautiful and it promises you it won't cost much, but the price just keeps going up and up and up and up and it delivers you a bill of goods that is no good. There's no value in it. And if you turn back and keep doing that to deal with it, that means, oh, wait a minute now, I saw a truck. And tomorrow you get on there and you start bidding on the truck. And that's, you keep doing what you're doing despite the negative consequences. You're a slave. You're a slave to sin and a slave to death. Second sign that you might, that might mean you're a slave to sin. You don't feel like you have any control over yourself when you try to stop. You don't feel like yourself anymore. If you're a slave to sin, you become the sin that you're guilty of. That you, your, your identity is grounded in what you do. Well, I'm a drunk. That's who I am. Well, I'm a liar. I have trouble telling the truth. That's who I am. Well, I'm addicted to pornography. That's just who I am. It becomes your identity. It's not, our identity should be rooted in who Jesus is and who we are as a follower of Jesus. And that's where we find our identity, but it gets rooted in the sin that we do. And we can't separate ourselves from the sin because now it's who we are. It means you're a slave. You're a slave to sin and death. Romans 6, thanks be to God that you used to be slaves to sin. You've come to obey from your heart the pattern of teaching that has now claimed you allegiance. We're trying to skip from the beginning, from the before picture of the house to the after picture of the house without doing the work that the Holy Spirit wants to do in us in between. You <laughs> There's a lot of floor joists that need to be jacked up. There's a lot of walls that need to be torn down. There's old sheetrock that needs to be replaced. There's plumbing and electrical that has to be gone through and it needs a new roof. You got to do the landscaping. You don't just skip from who you were. Now listen, I don't want to say that I don't want to say that salvation is instantaneous. Actually, I think it is. I used to work with a guy and I may have shared this with you before, so forgive me, I'm going to share it with you again if I've shared it with you before. But before I went into ministry, I worked with a guy who had a drinking problem. And he fell asleep after, after working third shift. He went home and he got his bottle and he lit a cigarette and he sat down in a recliner and he started drinking and he dropped the cigarette and he set the house on fire, crawled out on his hands and knees to the front yard and passed out before the fire department got there, burned his house down. Lost his house, lost his family, lost his children because mama said, we ain't doing this no more. And she left. I would have too. 
Finally, 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 he gets to the place where he accepts Jesus and he comes back to work and there's, they're teasing him about it. You know, your, your old friends that are unconverted will tease you about it if you've accepted Jesus. And they were asking him all kinds of questions about his faith and about the Bible. And he kept saying, I don't know, I don't know, I don't know, I don't know. He just then had his, he, he was just experiencing the knocking down of the old walls, Amen. He wasn't too after yet. He was just at the beginning of the process. And praise the Lord, he said something that only God can give him. He said, I may not know much about my faith, and I may not know much about my Savior yet, but this one thing I do know, I'm not the same person today that I was last week. Over a period of years, that man truly became a disciple of Jesus. I saw him a few years later, and he was in the process of trying to reconcile with his wife, and he was cleaned up, and he was well-shaven, and he was praising Jesus. He, he, was, he, he, was, he was headed toward after. Amen? The Holy Spirit was working on him through that process. Galatians 4 and 7. You're no longer a slave to sin, but God's child. And since you are his child, God has made you also an heir. Whew. Praise the Lord. Praise the Lord. Third sign that you may be a slave to sin. You work hard to keep it a secret. <laughs> If there's something in your life that you have to keep a secret, you're a slave to sin. This is why people who have extramarital affairs try to keep it a secret. They know it's a sin. Amen? You try to keep it a secret. When we confess our sin, that's when God is faithful and just to forgive us our sins and cleanse us from all unrighteousness. But we don't want to confess. We want to keep it a secret. Number four, a sign that you might be a slave to sin. You turn to your sin to deal with your sin. Well, I have found out that I'm an alcoholic and my family is left. I'm going to go have a drink. Does that make any sense? It makes no sense. But it's the way your thinking happens when you're a slave to sin and you're trying to deal with it. Well, I've spent all the money in my savings account on gambling. I'm having a hard time. I think I'll go to the casino. Right? You turn to it in order to deal with it. And the fifth sign, and this is a big one, I want you to hear me, that you may be a slave to sin, you're constantly discouraged. You're constantly discouraged. In Exodus chapter 6, the people are still slaves to the Egyptians. And it seems like God's never going to act. 400 years is a long time to wait. And in Exodus chapter 6 and verse 9, Moses says this to the people. He's told the people of Israel that the Lord had called him to lead them out of the land of bondage into a land flowing with milk and honey. And it says in Exodus chapter 6 and verse 9 that they refused to listen to him. 400 years of slavery had discouraged them too much. They had become too discouraged by the brutality of their slavery. I have good news. A Savior has been born in the city of David whose name is Christ the Lord. And he has come to deliver us from the bondage of sin and death. And you don't have to wait anymore to live in the after. Amen? <laughs> he has come. Listen. 
My prayer is that our lives become a before and after story. But you can't skip over after three minutes to the last three minutes. You have to follow Jesus in the in-between. Amen? You have to follow him in the in-between. But a Savior has been born. After 400 years of prophetic silence, a Savior was born. And here we are 2,000 years in. He's still a Savior. And we're waiting on his second return. Amen? Don't get discouraged while you wait. Don't be a slave to sin. Because Jesus came to set us free from sin and death. So whether you're here today or whether you're watching online, you do not have to be a slave to sin and death anymore. Praise the Lord. Because a child has been born. A son has been given. His name is Wonderful, Counselor, Mighty God, Prince of Peace. The government rests upon his shoulders and of his kingdom there will be no end. I'm going to pray. The praise band's going to come and sing. If you need to give your heart, loose the chains of slavery from your life, this morning is a good time to do that as we sing, as we pray. Father, we, we thank you so much for sending Jesus. We thank you so much that we no longer have to be a slave to sin and death. God, here we are at the end of the year celebrating once again the birth of Jesus in a year that none of us can remember has ever been this hard. But God, we know, we know through the presence of your Spirit that you have not abandoned us. That we no longer have to be slaves to sin and death because you came to set us free. God, we honor you. In the name of the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit. Let all of God's children say, Amen. If you need to come to the altar today and deal with whatever you got, whatever you're dealing with, this morning's a good time to do that as we sing.
beautiful way to, to start the new year and to enjoy Christmas as a newly baptized follower of Jesus. I can't think of any. And Don't if you're not that and you want to be that, we need to have a conversation. <laughs> Amen. My door is open anytime. Okay. <clears throat> Let's say this together. I am no longer, I am no longer a, slave a slave to sin. I am, I am. a child of God. In the name of the Father, Son, and Holy Spirit. Amen. One, two, three. Go,